On the one hand, Bomber Command, an insignificant force which spent most of the war bombing empty fields and, when lucky, killing innocent women and children in their beds. On the other hand, the mighty 8th Air Force, which single-handedly broke the back of the Luftwaffe and brought the German economy to its knees during its courageous daylight operations. Is it that simple? One of the best things about this channel is the knowledgeable people that actually watch the videos and then leave comments. It's really helping me with my research and I'm learning a lot from you guys. One of the comments that really got my attention because it challenged my long-held beliefs was about the bombing campaign against the Third Reich. It said, if I was looking to burn babies at night, I would pick the Lancaster. If it was 1943 and I needed to destroy the Luftwaffe in time for the invasion, it would be the B-17. I also found other comments in the same video, a look at the difference between the Avro Lancaster and Boeing B-17. Some of them questioned the courage of the RF crews compared to the American airmen, as well as asking if RF Bomber Command actually contributed much to the war effort. I was intrigued and had to find out more. Now, I'm not personally calling into question the courage or devotion of any of the men who fought with either bomber force. Each man was a volunteer and simply doing what he believed to be a job that would end the war and bring him home to family and loved ones. However, that doesn't mean that the aims and strategies behind the bombing campaign against the Germans weren't flawed. In this video, I want to explore some of these strategies and talk about what was achieved by Britain's Bomber Command and the 8th Air Force. If you watch to the end, you might even change your own perspective on this issue. As a student of the Second World War, you're probably aware that the biggest difference between these two bomber forces was the time of day they operated. Almost from the outset of the war, the British attacked at night, while later the Americans would fly their missions during the day. Was this simply because the British were too afraid to face the Germans in the light of day? Were the Americans too bold for their own good? I think we can answer both these questions by taking a look at the situation on the ground when each decision was made. The Royal Air Force, including Bomber Command, did most of its flying during daylight hours at the beginning of the war. Some RAF daylight bombing missions even continued as the war progressed. Nevertheless, after several disastrous raids into enemy-held territory, it was clear that the bomber aircraft being flown by the British could not survive extended daylight operations. I think it's also important to note that in 1940, the British had witnessed its fighters defeat mass formations of German bombers in the Battle of Britain. In early 1941, the British would have struggled to mount similar size raids against Germany and would certainly have done so without any fighter protection. Darkness seemed to offer the best chance of attacking Germany without the appalling losses suffered in the first daylight raids over the Reich. In one, 15 out of 24 attacking Vickers Wellingtons were shot down. That's a 62.5% loss rate which was totally unsustainable. Even when the British trialled 20 American-made Boeing B-17s with their added defensive armament, they found daylight raids to be too dangerous without adequate fighter protection. More on this a little later in the video. So is this the act of a coward? Or the right conclusion for a nation possessing limited resources to hit back at a stronger enemy? The story behind why men of the 8th Air Force found themselves flying daylight raids over occupied Europe is really fascinating. When the Japanese launched their infamous attack on December 7th, 1941, the 8th Air Force didn't exist, except perhaps on paper. Officially created in January 1942, it would take almost seven months for the first bombing raid to be launched. Major General Carl Spatz and Brigadier General Ira Aker, who was to organise bomber operations, had quite a job getting their force fighting fit. Although the joint talks, known as ABC-1, had decided on the famous Europe First initiative, which would see Allied nations focusing on defeating the Third Reich, the 8th Air Force struggled to get off the ground. Arguments between the army and its flyers over what their objectives should be and who should choose them slowed progression. This is something the British faced less since they had established their independent air force in 1918. Also, the swift expansion of Japanese forces and a threat to Midway in June 1942 meant resources were shifted from the ETO to the PTO and then back again. The British also added to the confusion by strongly suggesting American air power come directly under their own command, a similar notion they had for American troops arriving in France in 1918. Number 10 was quite adamant that the Americans should follow their lead and just add to their night bombing campaign. 
Britain, certainly the junior partner in terms of potential military might, had more experience than the Americans when it came to fighting this aerial war, and wanted to influence them to fight in the right way. This horrified the likes of Spatz and Aker, who likely had little time for these limeys who obviously didn't understand the capabilities of the American aircraft and equipment. In 1943, a year after the 8th Air Force was founded, the matter would be settled with some shrewd politics on the part of Spatz and Aker. Meeting in Casablanca, the British and the Americans would hash out the initial strategy to defeat the Germans, including the bombing campaign. It was feared, especially by Spatz, that Churchill would convince Roosevelt to adopt a night bombing campaign. To the British, it seemed inevitable that this would happen and questioned why the Americans wouldn't defer to their previous experience. Air Vice Marshal John C. Slesser, chief of the air staff, wrote, Americans are much like other people. They prefer to learn from their own experience. If their policy of day bombing proves to their own satisfaction to be unsuccessful or prohibitively expensive, they will abandon it and turn to night action. But they will not do this until they are convinced of the necessity, and they will only learn from their own experience. To Churchill, this must have seemed like a huge waste of time and resources, especially when RAF Bomber Command had been engaged in its own night bombing campaign all the time the 8th Air Force had been building up its strength. However, Slesser also added that, in spite of some admitted defects, including lack of experience, their leadership is of a high order, and the quality of their aircrew personnel is magnificent. If, in the event, they have to abandon day bombing policy, that will prove that it is indeed impossible. I do not believe it will prove to be so. Aker shared the British officer's faith in his own countrymen and was adamant that a complete prohibition on daylight operations would be a mistake. He said it represents complete disaster. It will permit the Luftwaffe to escape. The cross-channel operation will then fail. Our planes are not equipped for night bombing. Our crews are not trained for it. If our leaders are that stupid, count me out. I don't want any part of such nonsense. Indeed, Aker was tasked with doing something very drastic to stop the developing disaster. Flying to Casablanca, he attended a 30-minute private meeting with the British Prime Minister and laid out his case. During the meeting, Churchill stressed that, despite months of building up, the Americans had yet to drop a single bomb on Germany. Of course, they had been engaged in missions over France and the Low Countries since the 8th first op under the instruction of RAF 226 Squadron on July 4th, 1942. Even after what was to come, Churchill remained sceptical of the merits of daylight bombing. He later wrote in his memoirs, I had regretted that so much effort had been put into daylight bombing and still thought that a concentration upon night bombing by the Americans would have resulted in a far larger delivery of bombs on Germany. Nevertheless, what was said in the meeting must have convinced him enough to support Aker's plan. Aker predicted that by the end of January, his bombers would be hitting targets in the Third Reich. In response to the criticism the PM made, the 8th Air Force commander gave a full analysis of why no missions over Germany had been flown. Aker emphasised that the 8th had been held back by lack of long-range fighter escort, the commitment to Operation Torch and by poor weather. He also pointed out that the 8th's loss rate in daytime was lower than the RAF's at night. Perhaps what really convinced the bombastic Churchill was the benefits daylight raids would have for the war effort. Day bombing, Aker noted, would complement the night effort. The RF flying at night would be guided by fires set by day and around the clock offensive. Another key point was the fact that American crews had been trained to operate in daylight. They had limited equipment to successfully bomb at night. This meant that if they operated in the dark, their losses would increase and even then it would take months for the Americans to prepare for effective night operations. Aker wrote in the position paper he gave Churchill, We have built up slowly and painfully and learned our job in a new theatre against a tough enemy. Then we were torn down and shipped away to Africa. Now we have just built up again. Be patient, give us our chance, and your reward will be ample. A successful day bombing offensive to combine and conspire with the admirable night bombing of the RAF to wreck German industry, transportation and morale, soften the Hun for a land invasion and the kill. The end result was that the Casablanca Directive, among other key military strategies, set out a combined bomber offensive. In it were instructions for both the 8th Air Force and RF Bomber Command, outlining the major objective of the bomber offensive as the progressive destruction of the German military industrial and economic system, 
and the undermining of the morale of the German people to a point where their armed resistance is fatally weakened. So the conclusion to why the Brits flew at night and the Americans during the day is simply down to equipment and a combined strategy. Had the British had the ability to launch 2,000 bombers and 1,000 fighters on a single mission, as the Americans eventually did, they might also have flown during the day. Without a surplus of aircrew and flying an aircraft adapted for night operations, they never entirely made the switch, even when the Luftwaffe was on its knees. If you're enjoying the video so far, then please do give it a like to help it spread to more people, and why not get involved in the debate in the comment section below. As I've said, this video was inspired by comments which brought into question the bravery of bomber air crews from Britain and the Commonwealth. If you study the casualty figures, I don't think anyone can even wonder if these men weren't courageous. With hindsight, we can see that Bomber Command lost 55,573 aircrew killed in action. 26,000 airmen of the 8th Air Force lost their lives. Remember though, these numbers don't necessarily include those killed in accidents and those seriously wounded in battle. When you look at the size of the relative bomber forces, Bomber Command fielded around 120,000 aircrew from Britain and across the Commonwealth. The 8th Air Force consisted of about 210,000 aircrew. This means that at least 46% of Bomber Command was destroyed between 1939 and 1945. The death toll for the Americans stood at about 12%, which exceeded the death rate of the entire Marine Corps by about 9%. Only the German U-boat fleet was to have a higher loss rate, which stood at a mind-blowing 75%. So in essence, we're saying that Bomber Command, a substantially smaller force, fought for longer, lost more men at a higher attrition rate, and may have dropped significantly fewer bombs on target. Call it what you want, but I don't think those men can be called cowards. What I don't have is an indication of when Bomber Command suffered those losses. It is clear that around the time that the Butt Report was released in August 1941, the British were suffering about a 21% loss rate of aircraft over the Ruhr. At this time, the RAF crews had to complete a 30 mission tour or 200 operational hours before being rested. Pathfinder crews would later complete 45 ops. And let's remember, after being rested, many of these men went on to a second and third tour. Only 24% of aircrew managed to escape the war totally unscathed. When the Americans joined the fight, they were expected to complete an initial 25 missions. This was later raised to 30 and then 35. Of those who flew the original 25 mission bomber tour in 1942 and 1943, just 35% survived. The 25 to 30 mission requirements of 1944 saw a 66% completion. And by 1945, 81% of the combatants flew the full 35 mission tour of duty. This obviously shows the decline of the Luftwaffe and the rise of Allied air supremacy over Europe. What I'm not clear about is if this was reflected in quite the same way for night operations. Feel free to enlighten me if you have anything to add to this line of research. So one of the comments that initiated this video brought into question the relative courage and danger faced by each bomber force. Honestly, after 80 years or so, none of us are in a position to judge. That being said, we can perhaps cover some of the obstacles that all airmen of the period had to face. Besides the enemy, the biggest danger all aircrew faced was the weather. The northern European climate was unpredictable and often treacherous for inexperienced flyers. For those who had been trained to fly abroad, which was the case for all Americans, the change in weather conditions could be fatal. On a personal note, I did all my flight training in southern Belgium near the Ardennes and ran into bad weather on my first cross-country flight, leading to my first diversion to an unfamiliar airfield. That flight was less than an hour and the weather changed that quickly. And I have to say, when I saw that first lightning bolt shoot across my flight path, I got very nervous. Beyond the climatic conditions, there were the fighters. During the daylight, the Americans were at the mercy of the 109s and 190s for much of their war. Long-range fighters didn't really provide mission-long protection until the later part of 1944. What's more, while the British had operated their B-17s at 30,000 feet and experienced freezing guns when faced by fighters, the B-17s and B-24s of the 8th Air Force initially flew at lower altitudes. German fighters could climb above them without an issue, and this enabled them to launch lightning-fast attacks on the formations. British bombers weren't safe from fighters either. While many crews may have feared flak more, they were statistically more likely to be shot down by a fighter. 
As the war progressed, so did the technology. Night fighters would be able to target the British bomber stream and pick off British bombers at will. The adoption of Schrager music armament meant that for many RAF crews, the attacking fighter was never sighted and death could come suddenly from below at any moment. Anti-aircraft fire, or FLAC, was a common bomber killer. At night, it would target bombers with the aid of radar-guided searchlights and during the day, flak crews could visually set up a box of fire for American crews to fly through. Both British and American bombers were vulnerable on their bomb runs where evasive manoeuvring was impossible. For me personally, I feel that the benefits that darkness may have given British crews were sometimes outweighed by the difficulty of navigation and prowling night fighters on their return. On the other hand, during the day the Americans flying high in their forts and liberators were easy to spot and their crews could see the gathering swarms of fighters and flak coming up to meet them. The most thought-provoking part of the comment that sparked this video was what or who these bomber crews were targeting. The bombing campaign of the Second World War, particularly the British one, is an ethical minefield. A switch to area bombing, that is targeting a city and its populace rather than a single armament factory, was something that had been predicted by many before the war. The American proponent for air power, Billy Mitchell, recognised that civilians would be targets as early as the 1920s. He said, We must expect to have the enemy attempt to destroy any or all of our combatant or industrial forces. His attacks being entirely controlled by the dictates of strategy and the means of bringing the war to a quick conclusion, it may be at times the best strategy to damage and destroy property and to kill and disable any enemy forces and resources at points far removed from the field of battle of either armies or navies. Others also saw this future course of warfare. An Italian general and air power theorist named Giulio de Het said, how could a country go on living and working if pressed by the nightmare of imminent destruction and death? Another air war proponent was Hugh Trenchard, commander of the Royal Flying Corps into its evolution into the Royal Air Force. He said, the soldier carrying his rifle, the woman loading shells in a factory, the farmer growing his wheat, the scientist experimenting in his laboratory. If you set ethics aside for a moment, in a total war scenario, every enemy citizen is considered a part of the enemy war machine, and targeting them can bring that machine to halt. As horrific as it was, bombing civilians out of their homes and killing them en masse not only hampered the war effort, it also drained Germany of resources. Efforts were needed to care for the victims of bombing, as well as to defend them from the night raiders. This meant that those resources could not go to the fighting fronts. In addition to the effect on morale at home night bombing must have caused, there was also the demoralisation of men fighting at the front. Knowing that your kin were being targeted and perhaps killed while you were risking your own life must have been almost impossible to deal with. Of course, the strategic efforts of the 8th Air Force caused similar destruction if somewhat more targeted. People still died, but reportedly it was the night bombing campaign which really scared the German populace. Due to the American daylight raids, a substantial force of the Luftwaffe had to be held back from the Eastern African and later Italian fronts. Anti-aircraft guns also needed to be kept in Germany to defend the Reich. It's often thought that Bomber Command and the 8th Air Force worked completely independently from each other in terms of strategy. However, as we saw, the Casablanca Directive laid out the plan for both forces, destroy Germany's ability to fight and defend against an invasion of the continent. This mission was achieved by the British and the Americans in different ways. I think it's important to note here that the 8th Air Force was not solely a bomber force. It also included fighter squadrons. This meant that while the British reduced the Germans' will to fight one city at a time, the Americans attempted to do the same one factory or oil refinery at a time, while also meeting the Luftwaffe toe to toe. Following the issue of the Point Blank Directive, the emphasis was clearly on stopping the Luftwaffe from controlling the skies during the upcoming invasion of France. The 8th Air Force not only directly targeted key installations connected with fighter production, but also challenged the Luftwaffe to meet them in the air where they could be destroyed. Although the British had been doing something similar since 1941 in the form of circus raids and famously during the Dieppe debacle, the RAF could not send its fighters to destroy the Germans over their own backyard. This is where the long-range P-51s, P-47s and P-38s really came into their own. 
So in light of this, we can certainly say the 8th Air Force had a direct hand in crippling the Luftwaffe in Western Europe, but Bomber Command was also making things difficult for the Germans on the ground. One criticism that is often made of Bomber Command was its lack of bombing accuracy. The famous Butt Report discovered that only one in five British bombers managed to drop its load within a mile of short-range targets. Over the Ruhr, that dropped about one in ten. Even when a target was clearly marked, the bomber stream could drop their bombs increasingly early, meaning that most missed the target area. Although the myth of the coveted Norden bomb site has been put to rest, the Americans did have an advantage flying in daylight. When they could actually see the target, they had a better chance of hitting it. However, as we've seen, the weather was not always on the side of the Allies, and when bombing blind, the Americans had to rely on dead reckoning, just like the Brits. This would change with the introduction of more advanced navigational technology such as G, HS2, Obo, and GH. The British used Obo to great effect to identify and mark targets with its Pathfinder force. This meant that bombing accuracy at night improved remarkably by the end of the war. At the very least, it was harder for the Germans to fool the RAF into bombing empty fields or decoys. I discovered that the Americans also adopted some of these navigational aids, but found no clear evidence they used Obo or GH. If you have any resources or sources about this, please let me know about them in the comment section. As we've heard, Churchill lamented the fact that the 8th Air Force didn't drop more bombs in Germany. British bombing designs favoured bomb loads over crews to defend them. But we have to question, is it the amount of bombs you drop or where you drop them? Despite some of the more daring pinpoint raids such as Operations Chastise and Catechism, Bomber Command was committed to bludgeoning Germany into submission one city at a time. This being said, almost all cities targeted had a strategic reason behind their selection. Even Operation Gomorrah, the Anglo-American attack on Hamburg in July 1943, which created one of the largest firestorms of the war, aimed to destroy its shipyards. Nevertheless, the 8th Air Force was focused on more specific targets for most of its operational career. Operation Argument, informally called Big Week, was an all-out effort to target the German aircraft industry. Here it's important to note that these daylight raids were supported by combined RAF night attacks on the same targets and fighter protection of the American bombers during the day. Operation Argument also saw some of the earlier examples of the failure of the self-defense concept the 8th Air Force had. One could argue that it was not until the advent of fighters like the P-51D, which could escort the bombers all the way to the target and back, that the 8th Air Force really became mighty. So in this sense, perhaps the British were vindicated somewhat in their assessment of daylight raids. Another key industry targeted by the Americans was German fuel production. Warned of fuel supply issues through Ultra, the 8th Air Force targeted key sites during May 1943. This coincided with efforts of the 15th Air Force to attack the Ploesti oil fields in Romania. After the successful invasion of France, efforts to attack fuel production were renewed and it's estimated that German fuel reserves fell by 90% with only 632 tonnes being produced by the end of June 1944. So there may be some merit in the opinion I read saying the 8th Air Force did more damage to Germany's economy in two days than the British did in five years. Ultimately, this is a very complex topic and there's a lot more to be said. The original question was how effective was the bombing campaign of Bomber Command compared to the 8th Air Force? I think we can say that they were complementary and fairly well laid out by the start of 1943. Had the 8th Air Force never taken to the air, the air war on other fronts would have been greatly ramped up and perhaps the claim for destroying the Luftwaffe would have gone to the Red Air Force. Did the whirlwind whipped up by Bomber Harris break the will of the Third Reich to fight? It's questionable, but one American report compiled in 1945 certainly showed that the terror bombings of the Second World War seriously affected the morale of the German populace. Hey, if you've made it this far, then you are a true scholar, and I'd love to hear what you think about this topic in the comments section. Also, please consider liking the video to help it spread to more people, and why not watch the next video, which is on screen for you right now. Cheers.